Welcome back to another episode of the CSKA podcast. My name is Jared O'Leary. Each week of the podcast alternates between a solo episode where I unpack some scholarship in relation to computer science education and an episode where I interview a guest or multiple guests. In today's episode, I'm interviewing Grant Smith. Oddly enough, several years ago, I went to one of those like job fair things at a district where you just kind of got to interview with somebody and they'd ask some general screening questions. And I was talking about how it'd be really cool instead of doing like Microsoft Office Suite, you instead did like arts-based coding. And interestingly, Grant happened to be sitting at the table next to me and was one of the hiring people and was like, hey, let's talk about what we're doing. So I actually worked with Grant for the first year that I was in CS education. So it's been great to catch up with him and to discuss some different topics, like the importance of continuing to learn from other educators, what informal and formal learning spaces can learn from each other, how COVID has impacted Grant's teaching philosophy, our preferences for in-person or virtual professional development and classroom instruction, lessons learned from entrepreneurial adventures in CS education, learning by jumping in and trying new things, heuristic-based learning, and so much more. As always, the show notes includes many links to the resources, such as the podcasts, publications, and whatnot that we mentioned in this particular episode, which you can find by clicking the link in the description that you're listening to this on or by going to jaredoleary.com, which has hundreds, if not thousands, of free resources for CS educators, including a link to bootuppd.org, which is where I create the 100% free coding curriculum that I develop. With that being said, the interview now I'll begin with an introduction by Grant. My name's Grant Smith. I am a former elementary and middle school teacher. I was briefly a district admin. I'm also the author of Everything You Need to Ace Computer Science and Coding in One Big Fat Notebook. I've been involved in some CSTA projects. I've done teacher training with teachers across the country. I've helped write curriculum for CodeSpark, Code.org, the nine new Girl Scout coding badges, and a number of other school districts. Currently, I'm the VP of Education at Code Ninjas. We're an after-school program that's around the world. We teach coding to kids ages 5 through 14. I know you have experience writing a book, so this will probably be an easy question for you to answer. But we're going to flip it. Instead of talking about content knowledge, we'll talk about your journey into CS education. So if you were to write like an autobiography of your journey through CS education, what would the title of each chapter be? I would title the first chapter, Fake It Till You Make It. <laughs> And then I think I know what I'm doing, but looking back, it's embarrassing clear that I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> and then the next chapter is I have a ton to learn, but I'm eager to jump in. And the current chapter that I'm living would be, it's clear I can't learn or do everything. So it's time to focus. Yeah, lots of snaps to that one. That resonates with me. <laughs> what are some things that you've learned from each of those chapters? Yeah, so, you know, in the beginning, as the fake it till you make it, I was actually supposed to be a science teacher. My first principal said, hey, I noticed you can code. Why don't you teach coding instead? I thought that there would be a ton of curriculum support out there, other teachers doing it in the district, at least. And there really wasn't any of that support. And so I really had to jump in and just start trying and faking that I knew what I was doing to my students and just trying to see what worked with them. Luckily, I taught multiple periods. So if you've done this before, you know, by the last period of the day, <laughs> your lesson has finally been refined and you can kind of tuck that one away. And then I moved into training other teachers where I was still faking it. You know, you were there at Avondale with me. I was totally faking it. And it was so embarrassing, you know, how much I thought I knew when I really knew nothing. And that's where at Avondale where I started to shift my mind to, I thought I knew what I was doing, but then I started to see other people doing amazing things across the country, seeing that there are some amazing things happening at the K-8 space. And then I got embarrassed because I thought what I was doing was hot stuff and it really was nothing. <laughs> and that's where I kind of shifted my tune to, wow, I have a ton to learn. And that's where my next chapter started. That's kind of where I started to write my own book. I was approached by workmen to write this book. They already had the plan, the idea for it. They just needed someone to write it. So I jumped in, learned as much as I could about everything that they thought I knew already and put it into a book and started my own little teacher training business, training other teachers, eager to share what I had learned and to continue to learn from all the teachers that I had met. That's where I really started to solidify the idea that, you know, a lot of people understand that you can learn something from everybody, but that's where I really started to take that to heart and pay attention to everybody, every classroom that I visited, every person I spoke to, every teacher, regardless if it was their first PD they've ever been to and they've never taught CS in their life or if they've been doing it for decades and have research papers, you know, about it and whatnot. So everybody has something that you can learn from them. And then now I feel like I've done so many different things 
that it's time to focus and you really got to hone in on something because I guess at that previous chapter, like I said, I've written a book. I started my own little teacher training company. My wife and I did an Instagram thing. I did curriculum development for various companies, a Chinese company called VIP Kid. You know, whoever wanted work done, I was out there raising my hand and you just can't learn everything. And I realized I need to start to actually get some mastery and not be a jack of all trades. And so that's why I'm kind of focusing now and focusing on the space that I'm in now. Yeah, a lot of what you just said resonates with me. Like I've also refined my focus at boot up. So like I was spending a ton of time doing PD stuff. So now I'm spending more time just focus on curriculum and research and, and content and whatnot. But then even what you're saying with the like, you can learn something from everybody. One of the things that I've also realized early on is I can also learn what not to do from people because I've had some great educators in my life and some really bad ones. And I go, okay, I will make sure I never do that thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I didn't say it had to be a positive lesson from everybody. <laughs> I'm curious. So one of the things I like to think about is like something that I initially believed in when I was first in education and I no longer believe. I'm curious what that would be for you, like something related to CS education that you're like, oh yeah, this is great. And then now you're like, mm, no, I don't really agree with that. Yeah. Do you remember in the early days when it was popular to say, you know, as a teacher, you don't need to know anything about CS to teach it. I feel like I still hear people say that today, but I've visited enough classrooms now to know that really you should know something about CS to be teaching it. And it was a romantic idea. It was so nice to be able to think about that. Like, wow, I can do this too, even if I know nothing about it. And I think everybody has to start somewhere. So I'm not saying don't get started if you know nothing about it. Definitely get started. But I don't think that's where it should end. <laughs> I think that phrase was overused to the point where people release themselves from the responsibility of continuing their education, right? And so the PD that is offered now is still not enough. We have so much work to expand our own knowledge and we need mastery in computer science education. Yeah, I totally agree. I understand the sentiment, but I also know, like you said, it, it can't be the end point. Is there a piece of advice related to education that has really resonated with you? Yeah, I don't know if you remember Flora from our school district that we worked together at, but she was my boss and she would answer every difficult question with do whatever is best for the children. Actually, I have it behind me. You're not going to see it on the audio, but I keep that sign with me everywhere I go. And it's basically my answer and always my thoughts is in my current role, we do a lot of curriculum development. So whatever content we create, whatever I'm doing, I want to think about how this will impact the child. Children as a whole too, is this inclusive? How will this impact their lives? How will this improve their lives? And make sure that I'm doing whatever's best for them. So if somebody were to walk into like an ideal CS learning space or environment, what would they see here or experience? I love this question because this is one of the reasons why I ended up joining Code Ninjas. I love public education. I loved my time training teachers. I loved being a teacher. One of the cool parts about being in, in an after school setting is we have different constraints and we have a little bit more freedom to kind of do what we want. I wanted to join Code Ninjas because I saw the seedling company looking for how they can impact children's lives and help them learn coding, but not knowing how to do it. And ever since I was a teacher, I had always thought about what does that ideal environment look like? So I saw Code Ninjas as a place where I could go in and mold it to be what I had always hoped it would look like. And, and really, I love Mitch Resnick. I'm reading Lifelong Kindergarten for the third time right now because I feel like every time I read it, I gather something new. And so, you know, those four Ps are really what I look for. And that's kind of the simplest explanation. I can dig a little bit deeper, but, you know, the projects, peers, passion, play are really what I'm looking for and what I'm trying to accomplish at Code Ninjas. I strongly believe in all of those four Ps. I remember your podcast, Jared, with Mark Guzdal, where he talked about how he was a reformed constructionist. I loved that because I always thought of myself as a practical constructionist, right? Because it kind of in the same vein, right? Where you can't, and you too had talked about this, where you can't just do full bore on something, right? You have to balance it. And so that's something else that I think about when I want to think about the ideal experiences. I do strongly believe in the constructionist learning theory. And I love all the work that Seymour Papert has done. However, in the practical sense, I think kids and students need to be supported in ways we have to think about who the teachers are, how knowledgeable and skilled they are. We have to think about where the kid is 
developmentally, you know, how old are they, but you know, how much time have they spent in this space, everything like that. And so, you know, when I think about that, I think about kids building their own projects, excitedly sharing them with their peers, but also we're supporting them in ways that, that we can. I don't think of lectures when I think of the ideal learning environment for kids. I'm in the K-8 space, so maybe this is different for older kids, but I don't think of walking in and seeing a teacher at the front of the room lecturing the whole class. I think of kids engaging in things that they want to learn and the teacher pulling small groups or helping one-on-one or better yet, kids helping each other. At some point, kids do need access to knowledge that they can't just stumble upon themselves. That's kind of my balancing act with constructionists. But I don't think that's provided through a lecture environment, right? I loved visiting your classrooms, Jared, where kids, it looked like chaos. And it was amazing because kids are all doing their own thing and they're teaching each other. And you would sit there and help explain some really cool concept to kids. And they'd go home thinking about it and, you know, with a deeper understanding of it. But they were loving it. And kids kind of learned at their own pace. And I like that a lot, too. And that's the other part that I would say is, one of the nice things about not being in the public school setting is kids can go at their individually own pace. We don't have to conform to a semester. We actually have different programs where you can come in once a week, twice a week, four times a week. You know, there are different time periods that you can come in. You can stay for three, five years and continue and keep learning. And I think that's really cool. And so I don't know. Those are kind of all my ideal environments along with just kids loving it. Well, and for context, for people who haven't been in my former classroom. So like if you were to walk in to like, let's say a fourth grade class, they'd be potentially working on a scratch project or they'd be coding music using Ruby and Sonic Pi, or they'd be creating art and animation with JavaScript and Khan Academy stuff, or they'd be creating like some apps with like Swift and Xcode. So, so my role in that 40 minutes was to just kind of walk around, ask questions, facilitate. You personally have been into classes where I have literally spent all 40 minutes working with one kid just asking questions, guiding them through things, and just kind of like looking up every now and then to make sure like nobody's on fire or anything like that and make sure that the rest of the class is going good. But like your comment about the lectures, it was always one-on-one and it was usually in the form of questions and asking and trying to guide and as opposed to like full group, okay, class, we're all going to talk about this thing and I'm going to talk at you. So yeah, it's a very different approach. Personalized. Right, it is definitely personalized. But your mention of like having experience in the K-8, like it's the same approach that I've also used in high school, the same I've used with undergrads and with like graduate students, like it works like across all of them. So yeah, I'm more biased to try and avoid full group instruction. (laughs) Yeah, I think it's definitely the way to go. I mean, we have to support our kids, but I think there are better ways to do it. So you have a wealth of experience that many CS educators don't have because of your background, both in the classroom and then supporting classroom educators across the country. And I also have had some interesting experiences, like when I was doing music education stuff where I was teaching in the classroom, but then working in like these outside groups that were independent from any kind of school and organization and whatnot. And so like I too have seen the interesting contrast between these like formalized and informal learning spaces in different subject areas. And what I'm curious from like your perspective, like how does each inform the other? Like how does your experience in formalized learning inform the informal learning and then vice versa? That's a great question because I actually think we have a lot to learn from each other. And I think one thing I'm excited about is in the future, bringing more to conferences like CSTA, a couple of my team members at Code Ninjas are doing a presentation because I feel like we should share more. I don't remember hearing a lot when I was on the teacher side, the formal education side. I don't remember hearing a lot from the informal. And that may have been because I was ignoring them. And so I kind of want to make sure that we do get this back and forth conversation because I think there's a lot to learn between the two sides. One thing that was interesting that I have brought over from formal education into informal education is I know assessment is kind of a bad word for some people because of where state assessments have taken education, but it's an important thing to know what your kids know, right? Something that I brought into our informal space is I want to know what our kids know, how much they know about it so that I know how they need to be supported so that they can continue to learn. We're not going to do Scantron tests or anything like that, but we are trying to be creative about how we're approaching assessment. So, I mean, we're working with, you know, we've talked with Diana Franklin about ways to assess computational thinking in block-based coding environments, things like that, right? To try and understand how that's happening. We actually are 
developing our own learning management system where we're trying to build in assessments that happen in the background. So we're not even telling kids that we're assessing them, but we want to know so that we as curriculum developers can provide more or less support or more or less training to our facilitators to help them know how to support the kids when needed. Then the other part about assessment is we have a different set of stakeholders now. So before assessment was important to district admin who need to know where to support the schools and the kids that are in those schools. For us, we need to show parents progress. They're not going to pay for their kid to come to this program if they don't believe that good things are happening. And part of that is showing more than just the cool project. And this happens all the time. Parents ask, okay, this is a cool project, but what did my kid learn? <laughs> right? And so we need to be able to show them that, no, we do know what they learned and here's what they ended up learning, right? So it's, it's interesting. I thought I would get away from assessment when I joined informal, but it is something that I've kind of brought over. And then on the other side, you also interviewed Dominic Sanders. Mm -hmm. He did a better job at explaining this than me about personally connecting with kids. That's something I feel like we do very well in the informal space. And I know there are a lot of great teachers like him and you that do this. And I'm sure the listeners of this podcast also do this. But I feel like in the informal space, we do this really well because we have to. We have to have that personal connection with every child so that the parent feels safe dropping their kids off. So we tell our facilitators, you know, the first thing you do is connect with the kids. Like, I don't care what the kids know yet until you know their dog's name, their favorite <laughs> hobby, you know, all the things about the kid. And then we want to work with the kid. So that's something that's really fun. Yeah, that's a really good point. If we were to kind of generalize here and break things down into two categories in education. There's like the mandatory education and then the education where you volunteer or even pay to attend. And like you have to approach those two things very differently because if everybody is like forced to be there, then you're going to have kids who are like, I'm here, but it doesn't mean I'm going to work. But then if they are volunteering to be there or paying to be there, then that's very different because like if you want them to keep coming back, you have to really make it meaningful. Not to say that like you don't in the other one. Like having been in like music groups where I was literally paying thousands of dollars just to perform with it and to receive an education versus like a group where I was required to be there for a degree. Those were two very different experiences for me. Yeah, exactly. So you've been in education for a while and, and had a, a variety of experiences and knowing your educational philosophy and understanding like before COVID, I'm curious, like personally, like how has your philosophy kind of changed or been solidified since COVID? Yeah, I've had a weird relationship with virtual and online learning before and after COVID. I have a master's degree that was 100% online and loved it. The school I attended was amazing. They practiced what they preached. <laughs> it was in educational technology. And so they really did everything right. I actually started another program, a doctoral program that was also online. And we would be reading the research on how to teach online and they would not be following the practices. That... <laughs> anyway, so it was, it was really frustrating. The master's program, though, was done right. So I've seen both sides done right and done wrong. I've also made an online professional development course, right? But I've also done a lot of in-person teacher training. I've done in-person teaching with kids. I've also developed an, it was a synchronous course for VIP kids in China. And then I also worked for CodeSpark for a short time as their director of education. And they are a platform that teachers do use in their schools, but the primary audience is parents at home who just let their kids go on the platform and there's no support. You know, the parents don't know what's going on. It's just app driven, right? So I've kind of seen a lot of these different experiences. The culmination of seeing everything was why I was looking for an in-person experience because I had kind of dipped my toe in so many slightly different experiences. So when I saw Code Ninja, it's like, oh, this is great. I really want in-person. And then COVID happened a few months after I had joined Code Ninja's where just out of necessity, obviously, we had to do online learning. We tried to replicate as much of the community. Some of the things that I like about in-person learning is that, that community, you know, peers, at one of the P's, the kids coming together, be able to work with each other. And so we tried to emulate that. It's very difficult to do. And as we've been able to come out in some of our areas, you know, right now, Canada's just kind of coming out. UK is still kind of tough. In the US, a lot of our states are coming out. So we're seeing more and more kids in our centers. We're excited to have the kids back in centers is what it comes down to. We had a great run doing virtual stuff, but will not be pursuing that any further. We may have some select activities or small add-on programs for kids who 
are taking the summer off from Code Ninjas. Sometimes we have kids who do that and maybe they want to keep engaging at home on their own. But I strongly believe in the connectedness of an in-person experience, being able to connect with their peers, but also with our facilitators. I view our facilitators as more like mentors, someone who kids can kind of look up to and look forward to seeing. And so, you know, I know there are going to be teachers out there that disagree with me, but I'm willing to have a debate with them because I actually feel very strongly about the in-person experience, especially for computer science education. Yeah, I see both sides of, or both like camps, like, yeah, there's a ton of great things that can be done online. But in our internal discussions with Boot Up, we've been talking about this for multiple years now is do we want to have like an online component or what about like rural schools where it's hard to go out and do an in-person PD? Do we offer like virtual, et cetera? So this is like COVID didn't start those conversations. But we have consistently been like in person is the best way to model things is the best way to make those connections, communities, etc. So like, I'm in agreement with you. And I've done research on online like spaces. And I love them like they're great. You can learn a lot, but still prefer the in person. Yeah. And I think, you know, especially for kids, because for example, for PD, I made an online course that was semi synchronous. So I actually would mail them there were eight modules in the course, I mailed a box to the group and you had to form a group of four people in the group. And then I would mail the cute names for everybody. I can't remember what the name was for the person who received the package. But anyway, they had their job. They were supposed to receive the package and then they were supposed to meet somewhere. Someone's classroom. I saw people meeting at Panera, you know, whatever, open up the box together. And then they would look online on the course, watch the short little videos I had made and then do the activities together. So they were actually working on projects together And so in that way, we were trying to like replicate the in-person experience. So I think there are ways where you can leverage technology, like you said, to reach rural areas and whatnot. But for kids, I would prefer in-person strongly over pure online. I'm curious if we could expand upon like what you just mentioned. That was a really creative idea, very innovative. So you've had the experience doing something like that, but you've also had experience like writing a book. You also had experience like the project that you mentioned with your wife, like on Instagram, like what have these different experiences like through the entrepreneurship around CS education taught you about CS education? Yeah, there are a couple lessons that I learned. Some of them hard lessons, (laughs) some of them just nice lessons. One was progress happens when resources are allocated, right? But more resources does not always guarantee more progress. So something, you know, that you have to consider is teacher training, curriculum development, hardware, you know, computers, cool devices, robots, micro bits, makey makey, things like that. These all cost money. And also time is a huge resource as well. And so if you want to make something happen, you have to pour resources into it. The other thing is, it's okay not to scale. That's something that I learned later on is I was trying to scale things because I wanted to have a larger impact on more kids. And so I kind of realized that it's actually okay just to do something cool (laughs) for the people around you and do something small. So for example, my wife and I started an Instagram account. Well, it started out with, I read a research article out of Australia. It was titled, Unraveling the Cognition of Coding in Three to Six-Year-Olds. It's really interesting because the study was about, you know, trying to develop an assessment tool that assesses computational thinking in kids ages three through six. And I thought, wow, (laughs) what is this? Can you do that? And it was just eye-opening. And I had a three-year-old at the time and a one-year-old also, but I started to think, well, okay, they're trying to assess this. Can you teach it? What does that look like? And I'm also one of those believers that first, I understand we have so many definitions of computational thinking. I think we need one, I agree. I also believe that it has to happen with a computer. But I started to think about, are there precursors? Like what are the ABCs of coding and computational thinking? I have no idea if there's transfer. This is not a real study, but my wife and I decided to try and make activities for our three-year-old. And to hold ourselves accountable, we opened up an Instagram account. And I say we, it really was 90% her. I would kind of give ideas and then she would do it all. And so I should probably just say she, we would make these activities and then post them on Instagram just to 
I don't know, if you post it somewhere, you're more accountable, right? We did not think anything would happen. Two years later, she gained 15,000 followers, most of which had no idea what this was, uh, had no background in coding. Instagram will give you the stats. Almost all of the followers were moms of small children. And what was interesting is my wife has no background in computer science, has never taken a computer science class in her life. So our other little experiment was, can I give some ideas and then someone who doesn't know as much, can they make cute activities out of it? I don't know what the results are. I don't know if we failed or if we succeeded. I have no real assessment. I didn't use this Australian assessment on my own kid. I probably should go back and see. I also didn't have a lot of faith in the assessment that was developed. So I didn't quite know where to go with this. But the whole idea was taking it back to, it's okay to not scale big, but also progress happens when resources are allocated. For this Instagram account, little problem solvers. If you want to go look it up, it's still up. The activities are still there. They're all unplugged activities. It's pretty cute and a lot of fun to do with kids, regardless of if my kid learned anything or whatnot. You know, our one-year-old is now a three-year-old and we do the activities with her as well. The point is it took a lot of time. We didn't put money into it, but it took a lot of time. And if you want to make something happen, you just got to jump in and start doing it. And it was okay just to start with our own kids. We didn't have plans to scale. We ended up even doing a Kickstarter where we had pixel blocks. We developed a toy to teach specific concepts. And that was a fun experience too. And we just thought, can we do this? And then we jumped in and did it. And I think that's what I would tell teachers is just jump in and try, right? I'm sure everyone listening to this podcast has some amazing idea, is probably starting to think about how they can make it happen. And I would encourage everyone to just go and try and make it happen. There's a lot of cool things that still need to be done in computer science education and allocate your resources to it if you think it's worth it. Yeah, I like that advice. It actually resonates with me right now because like having one foot in two different fields, like it's been interesting. Like I've been doing all the CS content for a while now, but now I'm also like on the weekends creating like percussion content, which was like my original background in education was playing the drums and teaching people how to do that. I like started sharing things on social media for like the first time in years related to percussion and like the anxiety that comes with that. Like it's, it's been funny for me to like think through that and then go, wait, I have a podcast that reached like hundreds and thousands of people like every single month. And yet I'm nervous about like sharing something related to percussion on Twitter. Like, come on. <laughs> but this is also a great example of this podcast itself, right? You know, you saw a need I don't know if you have podcast experience. I never heard of it from you, but you just jumped in and did it, right? And and you learned what needed to learn. We had no idea what Instagram, <laughs> what it took to run an Instagram account, right? But we jumped in and we learned and figured it out. And I'm sure we failed in many ways, but it was very cool because now we have that experience and can kind of tuck it away. And, and it's just a cool life experience. I wonder if your answer to this question will kind of relate to that, but what do you feel is holding back educators or the field? And what can we do? I have a couple quotes in response to this because I love Alan Turing's quote, we can only see a short distance ahead, but we can see plenty there that needs to be done. <laughs> and that's how I felt education has been, right? There's still so much that we need to do. It's almost like, Jared, pick a category and then I will tell you how it's still holding teachers back. You know, everything is holding us back. Teachers need better and more training. We need more robust curriculum. Schools need more teachers and more resources to offer this to their students. Governments need more data to convince them to allocate more resources to the schools. You know, it's just a huge thing. And, and it goes to, even to the parents. Parents don't understand. On my side, the informal education, that's one of the things is like trying to help the parents understand what's going on. A lot of parents want this for the kids, but can they recognize good instruction or good program? Do they know what their kids should be learning? And so it's, it's everything, right? And that's why I say allocate your resources. Let's all pitch in <laughs> and let's make it happen. That leads to my other favorite quote from Katherine Johnson. Everything was so new. The whole idea of going into space was new and daring. There were no textbooks. We had to write them, right? And that's how I've kind of felt. That's what we're all doing all the time. Uh, we all make our own lessons, probably. We all make our own programs and content and PD and whatever else needs to be done because it's all so new. We're not going to the moon. But we're doing cool things regardless. <laughs> so that leads perfectly into the next question is, so like, how do you practice and iterate on your abilities as an educator? There's definitely something to be said about just jumping in and putting yourself, I know it's so cliche to say, put yourself outside of your comfort zone, but that's kind of how it goes. Put yourself outside of your comfort zone, do something, 
you wouldn't normally do. And then, you know, reflect on it and then try again. It's funny because I studied information systems in college because I realized when I was looking at the classes and everything that I would never have to write an essay. And I hated writing. And I was so excited to just be able to create projects for my homework. And then I was asked to write this book and it's 550 pages. It's not insignificant. And so I thought, you know, I hate writing, but you got to do things that you're not comfortable with. And I don't know that I would repeat a 550 page book, but I'm interested in shorter books. I've learned a lot about that process that I would have never been exposed to. And it was a really cool experience. And I hope it helps a lot of kids. I've talked to parents and, and kids who have bought it and they love it. And so that makes it seem worth it, even though it took three years and many weekends and nights and things like that. And then if I were to do it again, I would reflect, get feedback and then iterate, right? And I think that's the same for everything. Like when I would make PD, you jump in, do it, ask for feedback, always make it better next time. Ask for feedback, make it better next time. Yeah, I like that approach of just kind of getting outside of your comfort zone. For context, like this podcast, I'm an introvert and was like very nervous the first time I ever even did this and just happened to get Elia Kim for the very first interview and was like, okay, I'm jumping in. Here we go. Let's let's do this thing. And like the very first class I ever taught on my own, I had a panic attack right before it happened because it was just like, oh my gosh, like I hope I'm really good. Like I don't want to like teach this class very poorly, etc. And then even the very first video that I made for boot up, I've made like a few hundred now, but the very first one, it took me like a dozen retakes just to get the like the intro, the first like five seconds, because I was just, I felt so uncomfortable being an introvert, like putting myself out there and like sharing and whatnot. So I like that. Think about now how much you've learned about video editing, audio editing, prepping people for calls, you know, all those things are great assets to add to your tool belt. But how do you do that without getting that burnout that can come with like pushing yourself too far or doing too many things. That's true. I've said one thing. I've said, go and do it and allocate your resources, right? I say no now. <laughs> There's a balance, right? And I'm now in a position where I can't take on many additional projects. I wouldn't be able to write a 550 page book right now. I wouldn't be able to make a whole PD course. We've even put our Instagram account on hold because of what I'm doing now in my current position, it is just too much, right? And I want to have that balance. I don't want to burn out. I want to be able to see my kids. <laughs> and so there is a lot to be done. There is so much ahead of us that needs to be done, but we're no good to each other if we all burn out. And we need to find that balance in our lives and we need to find out what works for us. I know we've talked about teachers who end up leaving to go back into software development, right? Because the pay is not good enough. That's another form of burnout. And we need to find places that we can feel impactful, effective, but also sustainable. So yeah, it's all about the sustainable. Got to take care of ourselves. Yeah. Looking at the long-term potential impact of what you're doing right now and how that might impact things. Like that is something that I too am having to look at and also learn how to say no. Still learning. <laughs> Do you have recommendations for how to improve equity or inclusion in CS education? I'm not an expert on this. And there are far smarter, better people. I am in the learning and trying phase still on this. Personally, what I try and do is just make sure that everything kids do is personally exciting to them. Beyond that, I'm listening, learning, and trying my best. What do you wish there's more research that could inform your own practices? There are two things that I want more research on. And honestly, I need to do more reading. And that's why I appreciate this podcast. Thank you for giving me the Cliff's Notes version. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> I wish I did more. And so thank you for that. But also what I would like to see more research in is developing assessments for K-8 in creative ways, right? What we're trying to do at Code Ninjas is, is creatively assess kids in the background. And when I say creatively, I mean, they are working on creative projects. We are not telling them a question or a prompt and then they have to make something. We want them to make what they want to make, but I want to assess if they've used the concepts that we want them to use, right? So I'd like some more research on that. Obviously, there are bigger topics to be had like transfer. <laughs> and, you know, we transfer kids from blocks to text. I want to know if there's transfer to bigger areas. Is coding useful for other areas in life? I want more research on that. I want one definition of computational thinking. I want to know what that definition of computational thinking, how that impacts 
everything. It'd be helpful in talking to parents about what their kids are doing to know all of these things. A lot of parents are excited about coding and they want their kids to know this, you know, this skill and, and have this skill for the 21st century. But I think we need to articulate the why better. I think research would help us. One of them that stood out was like the definition of computational thinking. So I was involved in a summit that was trying to bring together researchers and practitioners to talk about and come to a definition of computational thinking. And there was a lot of what I would probably describe as healthy debate. It was very passionate in terms of what some people thought that was very different than others. And Ultimately, there was no definition that came out of it that was a unified definition, but it was at least good dialogue. <laughs> yeah, I think that would be helpful, right? What about something that you're working on right now that you could potentially help with? What if there's a listener out there who might be able to assist with that? What would that be? Yeah, we have big plans for Code Ninjas in what we'd like our curriculum and our programs and our what our kids do in our centers to look like. We're at the beginning of a huge shift in how we reach kids and what we do with them. We're excited about offering the best coding environment in the world, in my opinion, because this is why I'm here, right? I want to kind of make this the culmination of everything we know about practical application, you know, the practitioners, but also looking at research and then pushing the envelope. We've hired some pretty heavy hitters on our team that are also experts, people on this call may recognize Bill Marsland from San Francisco. We have Sarah Smolovitz from the Creative Computing Lab. We have Polly Smith from Nine Dots and a few other people that have done pretty amazing things. And we want to continue to add to that because we have such big plans for what our programs should look like. You know, it's not just selfish. It's not just so that our centers are the best in the world or whatever. I actually want to help push and help expand what we know about computer science education, how it should be taught, the pedagogy of it. And everything like that so that we can then help inform the community too. Because we have fewer constraints, because we can do what we want, I feel like we're in a position to further the field, but we need experts. So we have been hiring for over a year now <laughs> and continue to hire. Uh, if you are someone who has experience in developing computer science curriculum for K-8 kiddos, and you love constructionism, you love project-based learning, you love kids having fun, working in a self-paced environment, then you should definitely join us. We would love to have someone like that on our team. You can work remotely. And yeah, we have a pretty amazing team. We all get along. We love each other. Yeah. Do you have any questions for myself or for the field? Yeah. You've talked about heuristic learning. That's something that I want to get into more at Code Ninjas too. How do you make that practically happen, right? Like, what are your tips for making that happen in the classroom or in a classroom type setting? So that approach is an approach approach how I generally take like conference presentations like the very first like session I ever did I sat down and was like what kind of a session would I have wanted to attend and what I was seeing at a lot of the conferences that I was going to is very how to do this very specific thing in a very specific context rather than how to think broadly and then be able to come up with your own steps for your own particular context and so in my presentations, I have a tendency to give like two hours worth of content in an hour long session. And so what I'll do is I'll like point to these resources and be like, okay, we're going to spend two minutes talking about this thing that if you actually dive into it, it'll probably take you like 20 minutes to do. And so I will point to all of these things and basically like a tree, like branch out into all these different potentials, but not necessarily go down each one of those specific branches and really focus on the what thoughts went behind the thing that I ultimately ended up doing and use that as a model, but not as a mandate. So like, here's a thing and here's how I thought through and came up with this thing for this specific context. But you in your class and with your own comfort and your own community and students and whatnot, what are some things that you could think through to actually apply that in your context? Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. So I just want to make sure that I knew where you were coming from because I've been incubating this idea where we would be able to provide resources, like you're saying, just point to them. And for example, at home, just finished printing a Iron Man helmet for my six-year-old. We printed it together. We programmed the micro bit, soldered the soldiers or soldered the servos in and everything. And he loves wearing it around. <laughs> I want our kids at Code Ninjas to be able to come to our center and do something like that, but not be told it's an Iron Man helmet, right? Like, I want to be able to 
provide them with the option of, hey, here's what you need to know about 3D printing and have you know, various levels of depth that they can dive into. Here's what you need to know about the micro bit. Here's what you need to know about circuits and soldering and things like that, right? And then they theoretically could go and make their own thing. So is that within that house of what you were saying? If, if I were to point them to those resources like you do at conferences, can you see that being applicable in a setting with kids? Yeah, definitely. So there have been a couple of things that formed that thought for me. So I did an episode unpacking K. Anders Ericsson's, like one of his seminal works on developing skills and expertise. So I had a professor who working with pre-service educators was saying in that four years, they're not going to get enough time and experience to become an expert in education or even really know how to do education very well. No matter how good your program is, there's just not enough time to do that because you need to actually get out there and try and fail and then learn from that. So her particular approach was, I'm getting them to think as educators so that way long-term, when they do come up to some kind of a use case scenario or experience that is outside of the scope or not talked about in any of the examples or projects or whatever in the pre-service education, they'll at least know how to think through how to do that. And so for me, I'm trying to think of, okay, when I was working in a K-8 school, I saw kids potentially for nine years in a row, but what about after that? And what about outside of that? What about when they go home and they are away from anyone who can answer their questions? How can you get them to think on their own so that way they, it can be like self-directed learning? And so that was kind of like the overall things that really kind of guided that thought process. Because like in an hour or even a three hour long workshop with teachers, like they're eventually going to run into more questions. And so encouraging them to think rather than just how to do this very specific thing. That's what I tend to focus on. I like that because that's what my ultimate goal. I want our kids to be able to be innovators and solve their own problems, right? Sure, they code and they'll learn how to code. But the bigger thing is I want them to be able to know how to make their own Iron Man helmet without instructions, right? And just know where to go, what to ask, things like that. Yeah, I like that. I will say there has been some pushback. Some people who see me present or see me facilitate or teach a class assume I don't know how to do it the way most people do it. Mm. And so like they think that this is like a deficit and like I don't get it. And it's like, no, 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 you don't understand because I've done it before. I'm just choosing not to do that intentionally because I don't think it's as valuable. And so like there has to be some dialogue usually around like why you're doing this and that can be helpful because otherwise people might look at it and go, okay, well, the way Jared just did this is different than the other like 10 people that came before them. So clearly they don't know what they're doing. It's like, well. <laughs> to me, it actually seems more difficult to accomplish successfully, right? Because we have to anticipate where kids' minds will be, provide them with all the resources that they need, which is much more difficult than providing them one resource that every kid has to use, right? And so, yeah, definitely I can see <laughs> how this would balloon into a huge project. Well, that's exciting, though. I think that is kind of part of the future of where we could take this. Kids becoming amazing thinkers, right? And solving their own problems. Yeah, I mean, I hope so. Especially that's one of the main points of like computational thinking, whichever definition you go with. Most of it's around solving some kind of a problem. <laughs> so then where might people go to connect with you and the organizations that you work with? Yeah, you can visit us at codeninjas.com. You can find me on LinkedIn. Sadly, I'm not on Twitter anymore. This last year has just been too much. <laughs> I'll be attending CSTA. Bill Marslin and Polly Smith from my team will be presenting at CSTA. Sarah Smolovitz will also be presenting, but she won't be presenting as part of Code Ninjas. She's doing her own thing. Yeah, around the community, we like to stay present and stay active because we still consider ourselves teachers and educators and want to be a part of this community. And with that, that concludes this week's episode of the CSK8 podcast. Make sure you visit jaredoleary.com to check out the show notes or by clicking the link in the app that you're listening to this on. That way you can connect to Grant and check out his book and see the resources that we mentioned in this particular episode. Stay tuned next week for another Unpacking Scholarship episode and two weeks from now for another interview. Hope you're all staying safe and having a wonderful week.